All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a Congressional Internet Caucus Academy panel on the South Dakota v. Wayfair uh, decision that came out just a few short weeks ago um, and was actually one of Justice Kennedy's final decisions before his retirement. Um, we want to thank the Congressional Internet Caucus, um, which is hosting this event in conjunction with the Academy. Uh, the co-chairs on the House side of the Internet Caucus are uh, Representative Bob Goodlatte and Representative Anna Hsu, and on the Senate side are Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy. Uh, this briefing is the second in our SCOTUS Tech series, uh, which explores how the nation's oldest and highest court deals with massively disruptive, constantly evolving technologies. Uh, we'll have another event on July 23rd, uh, which will be discussing generally how the Supreme Court is engaging with technology uh, now and how it will continue to engage with, with technology policy issues in the future. Uh, feel free to use the hashtag, hashtag SCOTUSTech, throughout today's discussion, uh, and we hope you'll join us throughout the rest of the summer. Uh, so briefly, I would like to introduce our panel today. Um, so on my right, we have uh, Amanda Keller from the International M Municipal Lawyers Association, uh, we have George Isaacson, uh, who is from Brandon Isaacson, uh, argued the, the case for Wayfair in front of the Supreme Court, uh, and is also counsel for NetChoice. Uh, to his right, we have Jennifer Platt, who is from the International Council of Shopping Centers, and finally, Mike Dabbs uh, from eBay. So I want to thank you all for being here, um, and we're looking forward to the discussion. So. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just give a little bit of b brief background on the decision. Um, so South Dakota v. Wayfair uh, stems from a South Dakota statute passed in 2017, uh, which would allow the state to compel online, uh, online retailers to, to collect state sales tax on sales made to South Dakota residents. Uh, the bill had a few stipulations namely that the uh, only companies, only online retailers forced to comply with this uh, would be those with sales of over $100,000 uh, or with more than 200 different transactions to residents in the state. Uh, so those were the only companies that kind of fell under the purview of this law. Um, and so only kind of larger online retailers were affected, uh, including Wayfair, Overstock, and Newegg, uh, which did not comply with the law originally, citing a 1992 precedent uh, in Quill v. North Dakota, um, which actually uh, made it illegal for states to force uh, online retailers to collect sales tax unless they had a physical presence in the state. Uh, so this essentially has allowed e-commerce companies uh, and online retailers to avoid collecting state sales taxes, although uh, consumers who shop online are still uh, technically required to pay a use tax um, when they shop online. However, that uh, has a pretty low um, compliance rate. Uh, so this has been kind of the status quo as the uh, e-commerce ecosystem and internet retail ecosystem has developed um, and grown. Uh, but this decision actually overturns that um, and ruled that Quill was wrongly decided uh, and now this South Dakota, South Dakota statute has been upheld. Um, so Justice Kennedy wrote the majority opinion joined by Justices Thomas, Alito, uh, Ginsburg, and Gorsuch, and Chief Justice uh, Roberts wrote the dissent joined by Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Uh, so kind of implication is that states and municipalities now uh, are moving into an era where they have the latitude to pass their own uh, internet sales tax statutes. Uh, which will force online retailers to collect that sales tax. Uh, so with that background, uh, I'd kind of like to, to jump in the discussion um, and ask each of you uh, kind of what are the immediate implications um, and consequences of the, this decision for uh, kind of each of your sectors. So we have online retailers, um, municipal governments, shopping centers, brick and mortar stores. Um, what does this look like for uh, each of the, from each of those perspectives? So. I can jump in here. Um, so I think to understand what this looks like for state and local governments, it's important to take a step back and understand what Quill did 
um, what the effect of the Quill decision was on state and local governments. Um, so Matt touched on this, but one of the one of the most obvious impacts was states and local governments were unable to collect uh, the the sales and use taxes uh, for for many years, and, and estimates sort of varied as to how much money was at stake here. But even on the low estimate, we were talking about something like $8 billion a year of lost revenue to state and local governments. The high estimates was up to $30 billion a year. So we're talking about a huge amount of money that state and local governments were losing out on. And this was, again, taxes that were owed. It's just that consumers didn't understand that they had to be paying these use taxes. I think the collection percentage is something between 0 and 4 percent of consumers would actually pay a use tax. So now that the decision, uh, that the Quill decision is overturned, that's money that uh, in theory, is going to be um, collected by state and local governments now. Now, as to whether that will happen immediately, I mean, I think it's going to take some time for those laws to go into place. Uh, Quill and the, de the decision before it, Bella Hess, was uh, the law of the land for many uh, decades. I mean, really, uh, we're talking about 50 years or so. So states are going to have to enact their own legislation here. South Dakota very specifically uh, drafted this legislation to overturn Quill. Not every state has legislation that's teed up like that. Uh, from the local government perspective, you know, you also have some impediments to local tax collection. There's some state laws that might prohibit local governments from collecting, um, and so those laws will have to be amended. There's also the um, Streamline uh, Sales and Use Tax Agreement, which I'm sure others may get into, and it's um, – I think a, a very good effort at trying to simplify things for online retailers that want to collect money, but one sort of downside from a local government perspective is it uh, essentially creates a uniform uh, sales tax within a state, uh, including, you know, preempting any sort of local uh, tax rates. So if a city might have a higher tax rate than the state sets in that agreement, uh, there's going to be questions as to what's going to happen. Is the city going to have to amend its uh, local tax code? Is it going to still apply a higher rate to brick and mortar? Um, and then the last thing I'll say before letting other people jump in here is uh, the, the money obviously uh, is going to be a very good thing. And that, that's it. from our perspective, this was a huge win as a result of that. But th this wasn't just about uh, the billions of dollars at stake for local governments. We also had secondary impacts on local governments as a result of the Quill decision. And so specifically, as, as brick-and-mortar uh, stores were, were closing down, and, you know, we'll, we'll hear more about why that may have happened, but as those were closing down, at least in part because of the Quill decision, you lost sort of the main street of cities and towns. You lost, you know, the town center. So that not only impacts what the community feels like, but it also lowers property taxes. It decreases property values around it. It increases um, municipal services to have to, you know, combat nuisances and crime. So there were a whole host of secondary impacts that I'm not sure overturning Quill is really going to immediately impact. But, you know, from our perspective, um, those consequences were very severe. So we're at least, um, you know, very pleased with the result that we can sort of move forward on collecting a sales tax at this time. Well, I think in answer to Matt's question about what the immediate implications and consequences are, probably of greatest interest to this audience is the role that Congress plays. Congress is now the venue, the arena, where uh, the policy issues really are presented. Both the majority decision by Justice Kennedy recognized that Congress has a role to play, that Congress has the authority to set rules on what is appropriate and not appropriate for states to export their tax systems across their borders and require cross-border tax collection obligations. And the Chief Justice, in his dissent, joined by three other justices, uh, was very emphatic in regard to the fact that it's Congress, people who are interested in this issue in this room, uh, who should now turn their attention to this issue. I want to quote uh, a few uh, sentences from uh, the Chief Justice's dissenting opinion. He said that any alteration to the rules with the potential to disrupt the development of such a critical segment of the economy should be undertaken by Congress. He went on to say that the majority decision, quote, breezily disregards the cost that its decision will impose on retailers, directly calculating and remitting sales taxes on all e-commerce sales will likely prove baffling for many retailers. Over 10,000 jurisdictions levy sales taxes, each with different tax rates, different rules governing tax-exempt goods and services, different product category definitions, and different standards for determining whether an out-of-state seller as a substantial presence in the jurisdiction. 
and he was especially concerned about the impact on small businesses when he said the burden will fall disproportionately on small businesses. One vitalizing effect of the Internet has been connecting small and even micro businesses to potential buyers across the nation. We'll probably hear more about that from Mike. He goes on to say the court's decision today will surely have the effect of dampening opportunities for commerce. A good reason to leave these matters to Congress is that the legislators may more directly consider the competing interests at stake. So all that the Wayfair decision concluded was that physical presence is no longer the standard to be applied. Justice Kennedy referred to it as an anachronistic rule. That's now behind us. He did recognize the fact, however, that there may be other elements in the Commerce Clause that would be relevant to the question of whether imposing these cross-border obligations is a burden on interstate commerce and therefore a violation of the Commerce Clause, and those may remain to be litigated. But I believe most importantly is the obligation and opportunity for Congress to take what really is the chaos, chaotic condition that this Wayfair decision has created and set order to it. The point here is not that states should be deprived of the revenue that's associated with purchase transactions by consumers in their state. I think the court has spoken to that, that issue. The question is what should be the rules of the road? And we believe that those rules should be set by Congress. They should involve greater simplification, greater uniformity, protection from retroactive liability, uh, and uh, a system which makes it possible for the states to receive the revenue that uh, they are desiring uh, without burdens being imposed on commerce. And what's really necessary in order to achieve that is a transition period. We would also believe that Congress's responsibility to set a moratorium of, of modest but reasonable length to allow companies to adapt to the substantial new requirements that will be associated with tax collection. Yeah, so there's, there was a lot there from to react to. It's not on. Okay, there's a lot there from George to, to, to react to. Um, but I'm going to go back to the question from Matt, which is what the immediate impact is. For, for shopping centers, I think there's two points, and from the brick and mortar um, or retail community, um, and not even them, also the, the, the wholesale community who've been part of the Marketplace Fairness Coalition. Um, one is perception of um, this idea that, that the internet is tax-free is, is, is going to be wiped away by this decision. Um, the internet has never been tax-free. Um, as Matt noted, uh, the, the tax has always been owed and now there's a means to collect it. Um, and the second one is, I think, a functional one, which is we have seen um, hurdles to entry into the physical market. Actually, I take it back. We have seen a lot of online sellers moving into the physical marketplace because there's a recognition of um, that multi-channel retail is is the best way to reach your your customer base. Um, this decision, the Quill, I'm sorry, the previous standard under Quill, put um, a, an artificial hurdle there that um, stopped some online sellers from wanting to enter into the physical marketplace uh, because of a concern over creating Nexus that wasn't um, it wasn't currently there. I think we'll see that now erased, and we'll see a, a number of um, online retailers moving into the physical place, as as well as you know, small sellers like Etsy sellers looking at using pop-up opportunities in, in shopping centers um, and in, in other locations. So I think there's going to be a really positive aspect to this um, in, the market, in the marketplace to drive innovation of what um, improves a customer experience. Um, I think that there is a role for Congress, and the Marketplace Fairness Coalition has been working for um, a decade to really come up with legislation that would have addressed this as called for in the 1992 decision at Quill. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge now uh, to see how, because I think there's going to be a real push to see how states implement the um, this uh, this ruling from, from Justice Kennedy. Um, and I think that you're not going to see the, the chaos that I think is being overblown because it's going to be a thoughtful, orderly process um, as states are not automatically throwing out um, lines saying your collections are owed. But I think we'll see a number of states very thoughtfully and um, methodically uh, roll out standards based upon the South Dakota law um, in the coming weeks that it will 
you know, be very clear. So there are 24 states that are part of Streamline today, um, and of those states, there's thousands of online retailers that are collecting using the software available under Streamline. Um, so there's, it's already being done. It, it can be done, and I, I think we'll see it happen uh, s uh, smoothly across across the board. Thanks. So <clears throat> I'm Mike Dabbs from eBay. Um, thanks for holding this discussion. Obviously very, very timely, um, very important, very important uh, now and, and post Wayfair for, uh, for Congress to act. Let me just first explain kind of where eBay uh, sits in this equation because uh, I've been at eBay um, uh, less than a year and a half and, and so I don't have the long experience that Jennifer and, and George and others have had on this um, on this single issue, uh, but uh, coming in uh, in a year and a half, it is apparent how much, I think, misunderstanding uh, around uh, the mechanics of how a lot of this works practically um, uh, and uh, just, you know, certain state laws um, uh, should not be underestimated as we all go through uh, the next process. eBay is not a, a retailer. eBay is uh, uh, about 23 years old now, um, has always been since day one, uh, a 100 percent pure online marketplace, meaning that nothing on eBay's site that you buy or sell uh, does eBay own. Uh, we don't have any inventory, we don't have any warehouses, we don't do logistics, no trucks, uh, anything like that. We simply connect buyers and sellers uh, from across the country and around the world, and it's what we've done from day one. What this has allowed, what eBay and, and other marketplaces, uh, you mentioned Etsy and, and there's a number of others, has allowed is a real empowerment, an empowerment of um, small businesses, an empowerment of entrepreneurs uh, to come online, uh, to be able to sell their goods, uh, and to be able to reach customers in places they never thought they could they could do before. Um, and that has happened in no small part to an overarching framework around uh, how we look at small businesses on the internet and startups and not overly burdening small businesses uh, in ways uh, that create market entry problems and in, in ways that create uh, a lot of excessive costs and compliance uh, and unnecessary red tape and headaches that stop small businesses from becoming so many of the big businesses that we've that we've seen before. So our takeaway from the court cases are court, the court case is pretty simple. Uh, we were disappointed. Uh, we we thought that um, uh, that 50 years of Supreme Court precedent should have been left alone. Um, however, um, we when looking at the case, uh, it's clear that the justices were focused solely on large, or not solely, were focused on large retailers and how those large retailers operated uh, in a marketplace. Um, what we were encouraged by was Justice Kennedy and the majority opinion uh, being very clear that small businesses uh, under a Commerce Clause interpretation and as we look to a Due Process Clause interpretation as well are completely different than, uh, than large retailers. Uh, eBay, there's about six million sellers on, on eBay in the U.S. A lot of those are you and I that are just trying to sell old bike parts or an old camera or whatever. Hundreds of thousands of those are small businesses that I talked about. Um, some of which have grown up to be bigger businesses. And uh, what we were very encouraged to see is that in Justice Kennedy's opinion, he laid out three factors uh, as to how a small business sh uh, should or does, under the South Dakota law, receive uh, a reasonable degree of protection. Uh, factor one is that a business needs to do a significant uh, amount of business into a state. South Dakota's law, and if I leave you guys with anything today, this is the most important. South Dakota's law at $100,000 or 200 transactions, but if you just take the $100,000 of remote sales, if you extrapolate that across the country, that's a 37 or $38 million national threshold. So what we are very concerned at, that's factor one, factor two, was no retroactivity. 
Uh, factor three, be a member of the simplified um, sales tax and use agreement, of which only 30 percent of all the consumers in the U.S. are in that, so there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, but when, when, when we look at that reasonable degree of protection, what we're very concerned with with other states, because South Dakota, a very small state, only four states are smaller than South Dakota, that other states try to come down to that standard rather than look at the standard to what the justices said, which is a number that should be big enough uh, to keep small businesses out of this equation so that they're not subjected to 10,000 different taxing jurisdictions across the country. So we look at it completely from a small business perspective. While we're disappointed in the court's case, we're encouraged as to, as to some of, of, of what the justices, uh, Justice Kennedy in the opinion had to say, uh, but it's clear that it's time for, for Congress to act, and I know we'll talk more about that. Definitely. Uh, thank you all for those perspectives. Uh, I think one thing uh, that we should touch on um, and was touched on a little bit in those comments uh, was kind of the next steps for state and local governments. Uh, and so this is more for Amanda and Jennifer. Um, and Jennifer, you mentioned that this isn't going to be quite as chaotic of a process um, as some people are, are claiming or predicting. Uh, and that these states and municipalities will kind of have a thoughtful approach to uh, to passing these laws uh, that that may mimic the South Dakota statute. Uh, I think one of the questions around that is is even if um, each of these states and local governments kind of has this thoughtful process uh, in creating these laws, just the sheer number of these governments. Um, could lead to chaos despite the best of intentions, I think. Uh, so kind of how do you react to that argument that even with um, these really good processes and, and this kind of precedent with South Dakota's law, um, like some states and municipalities might be trying to lower those thresholds or um, kind of have different uh, legislative features in their laws. Uh, so how do you react to that? I think that the Supreme Court provided a pretty clear <clears throat> pathway for states to look at South Dakota. Um, and I think that Mike did a great job of outlining what those, what those standards are for other states. Um, and we expect that, you know, one of them is, is you know, they, they complimented South Dakota on being uh, part of the streamlining and sales tax, um, sales and use tax agreement, which provides a lot of simplifications. It provides, you know, one... Um, collection point. I mean, so there's some really is some, I think, important um, simplifications that often get missed. Um, you know, as we had been working on legislation that, such as the Remote Transactions Parity Act, that would have taken the 10,000 jurisdictions and made it into 45. Um, so there were some, there, there have been a number of simplifications that have been suggested. Um, and I think the Supreme Court provided a really clear pathway for states to follow and we'll be encouraging states to to do just that. Um, will they, you know, it's it's really now the state's rights to um, question that needs to be, be challenged. And there may be, and I fully expect there will be litigation that um, you know, pushes on various states. Uh, I know there's been been some, I guess, um, rumblings about California, for instance. Um, and, and so, you know, th there may be additional litigation that comes forward to, uh, to, to, to provide additional clarification, but um, we'll be encouraging states to follow what, uh, what the Supreme Court suggested. Matt, if I could comment on both Jennifer's comments now and, and in her earlier comments. She uh, stated that she thought there was an orderly process the states are, are following, but the experience that we are uh, observing is that there is, in fact, considerable confusion and chaos. So, for example, some states are applying their laws retroactively. So states like Massachusetts, uh, Hawaii, Massachusetts is going back to October 2017, even though the decision was decided in, Jan in June of, two of 2018. Uh, Hawaii is going back to January 1 of 2018. So a real issue is the retroactive application of uh, state uh, mandatory tax collection laws. There are other states that said we're starting our obligation on July 1. 
So states like Kentucky and Vermont and Mississippi, uh, totally unrealistic for companies to be able to uh, not only acquire the software, but to integrate the software and develop the compliance structure for doing so. So the states have been unsympathetic to the issue that this is a, a matter that requires a grace period uh, before its implementation. Congress can step in and address that issue. Congress can establish a moratorium, a transition period. Congress can enact legislation that would protect companies from retroactive liability. And that's why the real arena for the next step uh, is Congress. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that Jennifer feels that um, things like mandatory streamlined participation um, should be a requirement under the Commerce Clause. Congress can make it a requirement, thereby avoid the question of litigation to determine whether that element of the majority decision, in fact, is mandatory or simply precatory, uh, really cries out for clarity. And I don't see where either the states or big box retailers or electronic merchants and catalog companies in any way are disadvantaged by clarity that would result from federal legislation. Can I just jump in on one thing you said, George, and that's the um – the idea that there's, you know, going to be chaos in the implementation here and that we need a moratorium. And, and forgive me because I don't remember the name of the fourth uh, defendant in the South Dakota case, but it was – remind me who that was. It's System X. Thank you. So, you know, if I recall correctly, System X was in this lawsuit and, you know, South Dakota sued – for declaratory uh, judgment, and they said, okay, we'll comply. And, my, and I could be wrong on this, but I think my understanding was that they started complying essentially overnight. And so I realize that your, your response may be, well, they're a huge company versus the small businesses that we're concerned about here. But it, it is possible for companies to start complying, particularly with the streamlined sales and use tax agreement. You know, there's software that's available that's paid for by those states. And it's not perfect yet, but I think the idea that we would need a moratorium here is, is you know, pushing the envelope a little bit too far. Well, let me clarify the record. First of all, what System Acts agreed to do was to start paying the tax, um, not, not collecting the tax. When Wyoming passed an identical law to that of South Dakota, based upon the experience they had in South Dakota, System Acts said, we need six months in order to implement that system, and Wyoming agreed to give them a six-month grace period. And so even a large company like System Acts needed a transition period in order to collect. Think what that means for smaller companies, mid-sized and small companies, that neither have the accounting staffs, the software, the integration, and especially as we are now entering fourth quarter, which for many direct marketing companies is their, their major quarter for sales, for them to have to carry the burden of dealing with this issue at the same time that they have their their, their major retail sales period um, is, is not practical for them. And they will, they will end up not properly complying and conforming, being subject to assessments, and having liabilities that they did not anticipate and which could have been avoided. Can, can I also just, um, you know, w one of the biggest concerns that we have um, is that in the rejection of the physical presence rule, um, that states are now, you know, empowered in ways uh, not um, absent of what the court has said to start to require uh, businesses uh, that have no physical connection to that state um, to do the collection and remittance uh, uh, for those sales. And the concern about that a lot of times is that it goes back to the old, you know, the old kind of tax adage of don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy behind the tree. And when you can levy a tax on somebody that's way 3,000 miles away, that's got a small to medium-sized business, and you can say to them, hey, we think you owe a lot more than you paid us, come up here in, in Wisconsin tax court. Um, it makes that dynamic of out-of-state jurisdiction, cross-border reach, really, really scary. And I think that when we look at, at Wisconsin, what they've come out and said, um, because Governor Walker wanted to announce that there would be a tax cut, 
is that because of the additional revenue from remote sales tax purchases, that Wisconsin um, um, residents will get a corresponding tax cut. And the real concern is, is when he, you know, they're trying to get every dime, how does that apply to, uh, to small businesses? Like George said, without the sophisticated tax uh, and, and compliance uh, departments. Because uh, Wisconsin's relying on a 2013 statute um, that is not a new statute, that doesn't follow what the court has, has said. Uh, it will result in litigation, and it's gonna, we're going to see more and more of that type of thing um, across the board. So when George talks about a tax moratorium, we're in total support. There needs to be a pause uh, to allow um, uh, Congress as well as the states. Um, and let's not forget, and George argued before the Supreme Court, so I wouldn't presume to um, to, to, to give the legal analysis here any, any better than him. Um, but the, you know, the Wayfair Court did not say that South Dakota law was constitutional. The Wayfair Court simply said you can't use physical presence anymore as the determining factor for substantial nexus. Now go back uh, to court and, and figure out whether or not it's constitutional. Uh, so there's, even South Dakota still has to figure out whether or not their law is constitutional. Um, and we shouldn't just race to get ahead to provide tax breaks or political benefits uh, uh, in order to try to collect this revenue as quickly as possible. So I think um, an important maybe misunderstanding is that the tax is not on the business. The tax is on the consumer that's purchasing the product. It is a consumption tax. So it is the, it is the consumer in Wisconsin that would be paying the tax. Um, and, and as far as the, the regulation on the business that's not physically located in the state, there are a number of examples, but the one um, that comes to mind for me are wineries. There are a lot of wineries that don't like um, certain states' shipping laws or, or wine distribution laws, and so they simply say, I'm sorry, we will not sell to those states. So if there is a state, I think, like Wisconsin or others, where a seller finds it too burdensome to avail itself uh, to that customer base, they can opt out. They can simply say, I'm sorry, we don't sell to that state. Um, and, and I think that's the cost of, and I think that's what this, this decision said, is if you were going to do business in the state, if you're going to avail yourself of the consumers in that state, then you need to be collecting the sales tax of that state. All right, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think one of the kind of important questions uh, that we're at now is, um, and we've and we've touched on this quite a bit, is kind of where can Congress go from here? Um, and obviously, we're in the uh, Rayburn House Office Building right now. Uh, probably a lot of people kind of interested in what the lay of the land is moving forward um, in Congress. And and both the majority and dissenting opinions recognize that ultimately um, this question can can only fully be resolved by Congress. Uh, so to each of you, I'll just kind of ask, what would a satisfactory legislation look like? Uh, what, would, um, what would be kind of a, a good compromise between um, kind of where we're at now, uh, where there's a little bit of uncertainty, uh, versus kind of where we were at before um, when Quill was still in place? So. Uh, I mean, I... I think uh, on one level, I, I sort of dispute the idea that this can only be resolved by Congress at this point. You know, from our perspective, states have always been considered the laboratories of democracy. Um, I think there is an opportunity for states to uh, go out and, and work on tailoring legislation that's specific to their needs. If, I'm not necessarily, you know, opposed to congressional action here. I just worry about a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, when you're talking about states' rights and federalism principles. I mean, South Dakota is a very different state than, than New York, than California. And, you know, it may be that we'll see, you know, more litigation as a result of states doing this, but that's also sometimes how we find some of our solutions. Um, so, again, I'm not necessarily opposed to congressional action, but I think if it happens, we need to be uh, careful to weigh the state's rights um, as, as you're considering this. Um, this is uh, money that is sorely needed uh, by state and local governments, and it's been owed for a very long time. And, you know, I, I'm personally not aware of the retroactive liability concerns. I do think that's an area that would be very appropriate for Congress to uh, legislate in. And, um, you know, I, 
my only understanding from that comes from the briefing, which said it appeared as though at least 40 states um, had their own sort of state law or constitutional state principles that would prohibit retroactive liability. And obviously, um, again, I'm just reading that from the briefs, and I, I believe that uh, there may be states that are acting uh, differently there. So that's an area where I think we'd probably agree that uh, Congress could come in and, and prevent some of that heartache for, for some of the small businesses. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly would op welcome the opportunity for states to act in this area. Let me just set uh, some context that I think may be helpful to, to Matt's question. In the European Union, there's the VAT tax, and the European Commission, which is the executive arm of the European Union, came out with a study that said that requiring companies to comply with 28, soon to be 27, different uh, VAT regimes was, in fact, a burden on commerce uh, among the European Union states and that it was suppressing the development of cross-border sales uh, electronically and proposed to instead simplify that system and have it be administered in a base state system, quite similar to what we have in this country in Canada in the International Fuel Tax Agreement. So you take 28 uh, jurisdictions that were too complex in Europe, and you compare that to the 12,000 jurisdictions that we have in the United States, and it cries out for action to simplify that system. The quid pro quo here should be that if states are going to be able to export their tax systems across state borders, as well as municipalities and home rule jurisdictions, there should be simplification. So in direct answer to your, your question, Matt, what should federal legislation look like? It should act quickly to protect against retroactive liability. It's interesting, in those 40 states that joined the Colorado brief that you're mentioning, they did not disclaim retroactive liability, but said each state would have to decide that issue themselves. That's a pretty threatening concept uh, that direct marketers are seriously concerned about, and some states are acting in that adverse direction. Congress should act to say no retroactive liability. Congress should act to establish a moratorium. You know, a six-month moratorium getting past this fourth quarter, letting companies make an adjustment before they're obligated to collect, and then adopting very reasonable simplification requirements. Uh, in addition to those items that are part of the streamlined sales and use tax agreement that Jennifer has referred to and uh, Mike has referred to, um, rate simplification should be part of this. Uh, one rate per state for all remote commerce simply makes sense. Companies should not be subject not only to 46 different states with sales and use taxes uh, be subject to audit, but home rule jurisdictions, there are over 500 home rule jurisdictions in the United States that conduct their own audits. Uh, one audit on behalf of all participating states <coughs> makes eminent sense. There's no reason why the definition of products should vary. Uh, in his dissenting opinion, the Chief Justice points out, why should Twix and Snickers be subject to different tax treatment in the same state? It just doesn't make sense. Why should uh, sneakers be athletic equipment in one state and apparel in another state? Uniform definitions would simplify. This doesn't take any money away from the states. All that it does is takes a, an, an American economy uh, that is increasingly reliant upon electronic commerce and to rationalize it, to modernize it, to contemporize it. Uh, these are the, the steps that Congress can take without in any way uh, harming states in regard to the revenue that they uh, anticipate getting and will be getting as a result of the Wayfair decision. So I would just like to say that I wish that the, the points that George just laid out, we could have had that conversation five, four, three years ago um, before this case moved forward to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, made its decision on Quill, because I think that a number of those things are, the, are, are built into the Marketplace Fairness Act in the Senate that passed in 2013 or in the Remote Transactions Parity Act, which has been introduced in a couple of Congresses, is now um, carried by Congresswoman Nome. Um, I mean, I think that those, those are a lot of what we've been saying is there's a pathway to simplification and collection that kind of would have been an, a win for everyone. That's not the conversation that we've we've been having. And so I think from a practical standpoint, um, 
you have to look at votes. You have to look at states um, where the votes in the states are. Uh, so Susuta has, uh, that's my short version of the streamline. Susuta has uh, 24 states and none of the big ones for the most part. Um, so you don't have California, Texas, New York, Florida. Um, I think it's going to be really difficult to get those states to submit their taxing jurisdiction to a third party or group. I mean, they've basically said they won't do it. So that's what we came to a two pathway approach um, that would have allowed for Susuta states to be able to grant be granted collection authority. And um, and those other states would have had to meet some other simplification standards. Um, I think that that if Congress does take up legislation, that, that will have to be the practical um, conversation that's had. And I think there's a number of other conversations, other topics that need to be dealt with, with foreign sellers, with dead, with retroactivity. Um, certainly there's both functional and fairness issues along with that. Um, but I can tell you for the Marketplace Fairness Coalition, uh, you know, our, our membership is split at this point. We do have members that would like to see simplification, and we have members that believe that the states should have the ability to, um, to move forward and implement their own laws um, using their, their restored rights under, under Wayfair. Um, so I think from a practical standpoint, um, there's going to be some challenges to moving quickly. However, you know, let's, let's let the process work. Let's have some regular order. Let's, uh, let's I think, probably... Um, a hearing would be, at the minimum, uh, an opportunity to discuss uh, discuss this more um, robustly with stakeholders. Um, always open to having conversations to see what's possible, uh, but I think that there are going to be some practical political challenges uh, moving quickly. Yeah, so uh, everything about simplification, clarity, um, uh, the need for federal legislation, you know, we, we, we definitely agree with that. I mean, I, I do think that we're going to see um, significant legislation throughout the states as they try to meet uh, these different thresholds um, as set out uh, by the court. Um, the one thing I would add on is what the Marketplace Fairness Act and the Remote Transactions Parity Act both fail to do, among other things, um, is, is a real small business um, exemption like South Dakota that truly pro um, protects those small businesses that are starting up, getting off their feet, uh, and building a business um, uh, that we see on eBay and we see across the country uh, every day. A um, million dollars, uh, it's like the Austin Powers movie where he's like, one million dollars. Right, and everyone laughs. Well, we kind of look at that from a business perspective and say a million dollar small business for national sales. We have businesses on eBay that have three employees. They're taking home $40,000 a year and they sell a million dollars in sales. It's not an accurate depiction of a number. Uh, and to date, no one's ever been able to give us any data as to why a million dollars should be one. Now we have a standard, right? South Dakota uh, uh, is at a 37 million national standard. We're not saying it has to be that high, but it has to be at a level, either by sales or by employees, that truly takes into account the businesses at these size, the sophistication of their tax and compliance departments, and how they can fit that. And I, I, I think as part of any federal legislation, leaving those small of the small businesses out of it uh, it makes complete sense. The money is not in these tiny micro and small businesses and what they're doing online. Uh, I think in, in uh, you know, 17 out of the 18, Wayfair being the exception of the top uh, retailers that are online, currently collect and remit in all 50 states. Um, Justice Roberts in his dissent said 86 to 93 of the top 100 currently collect and remit. So the big retailers that are out there, um, you know, that's, that's not an argument for eBay to have. But for eBay, a small seller exemption as part of any federal legislation is mandatory. And if we could get to a place where it was a real number, I think we could get to a much easier place on, on how to find uh, um, a, a permanent congressional uh, federal uh, bill. Great. Uh so I want to leave time for audience questions. Um, 
But before we get to that, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Justice Kennedy's departure um, from the Supreme Court and what kind of what that means for this uh, this area of jurisprudence. Uh, obviously, he wrote the majority opinion, um, and all of D.C. is kind of on the edge of their seat right now, uh, waiting for the announcement of the new Supreme Court uh, justice tonight. Uh, so kind of with Justice Kennedy's retirement, um, if there's more litigation uh, in this area and it gets to uh, the Supreme Court, uh, what kind of effect will, will his retirement have? Um, well, interesting question. And, you know, taxation, and, and George can probably speak to this um, better than I can, but t taxation, when you look at Supreme Court cases, don't neatly divide along, um, you know, sort of the, the more traditional liberal and conservative lines. And so you look at the lineup of this case, and the dissent is, you know, the Chief Justice with uh, Justice Kagan, Sotomayor, and Breyer. And then you've got Justice Ginsburg uh, along with Kennedy, uh, Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch. So it's really hard to predict what the replacement uh, of Justice Kennedy would do in this area without knowing who the specific justice is and what their sort of um, tax, uh, tax law ideology is, what their state rights uh, principles are, their federalism principles. So, you, you know, I guess that's just my way of punting that this is a, it's an interesting question, but I, I, you know, I really wouldn't be able to know until I know who the candidate, uh, who, the, who the actual justice is. I think even after you know who the justice is, well, it would right. be very hard to, <laughs> to predict. Uh, you look at this very strange uh, collection on the majority side and on the minority side, uh, having uh, the Chief Justice uh, joining with uh, liberal members of the court, having Justice Ginsburg joining with uh, conservative members of the court. Uh, I think the court does not have a great appetite for state tax cases. Uh, it took 25 years before they decided to revisit this issue. Um, if I'm practicing law 25 years from now, Matt, I'd be glad to give you a comment on where I think <laughs> that, that bench might go. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just say it would have been a whole lot better if Justice Kennedy had retired 10 days early. <laughs> Uh, but in all seriousness, I mean, we knew Justice Kennedy. He had, he had been very clear on on his um, both in the DMA case uh, on uh, his 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 wantingness uh, to review Quill. Um, so we we certainly understood that. I, we are thankful, I think, again that he left language uh, in that opinion for the future court to look at uh, that makes a very clear distinction when looking at a commerce clause. Um, how states uh, should be treating thresholds in small businesses. So I think, you know, completely to be de determined. I th uh, one other factor I think we should all think about, too, uh, that is a concern out there for a lot of other industries, right? On eBay, you sell, you sell goods, um, you know, retail-type uh, goods, and that's what we're all talking about today. But what does this opinion do for other types uh, of services, right? A lot of these taxes are goods and services. So um, uh, how do states start to look at professional services and uh, different things like streaming services and those types of things? It's a real concern. And it's something that both state legislatures, Congress, and the courts are gonna be looking a lot at. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, what, uh, you know, a new justice as well as the existing justice, kind of how they view some of that. All right, so uh, now I'd like to open up uh, the panel to questions. You've got about 10 minutes left, so probably three or four questions. Here. Great, it's a fast question. See, don't have that choice. The question is for George Isaacson. Uh, I think for the staffers in this room, it would be a mistake to go home to your boss and say, it looks like physical presence is dead, because that's not what happened. The Supreme Court, George, said, don't count on us at the Supreme Court and our old 50-year-old physical presence rule. We're going to make that go away. But Congress can make physical presence the rule again. And then it could use that, what did you call it, a quid pro quo for other simplifications states could undertake in order to overcome physical presence. So physical presence isn't de dead. It's just, George, that the Supreme Court said their version is no longer law. In his dissenting opinion, the Chief Justice, speaking for three other justices as well, went through a series of different possibilities 
in regard to how Congress could act, including restoring a physical presence test or establishing a physical presence test and then having an exception for it for, company, for country, uh, <laughs> countries, for states that in fact simplify and make more uniform their tax systems. Um, and, and one of the things which I'm, I'm encouraged by and agree with, uh, with Jennifer on, uh, it's time for industry, the states, the big box retailers to really have a serious conversation about what an American consumption tax system should look like. And the issue isn't whether the state should be deprived of revenue. The issue is how can you simplify the tax system to make it work for all of the participants. And you know, I would hope that the panelists on this table, the people who are attending uh, this committee hearing would, would see congressional action as an opportunity for that kind of uh, discussion uh, followed by real action for greater simplification. Another question? Uh, right here. What do you think the impact of this court decision will be for small retailers outside the U.S. but that sell into different states in the U.S.? You know, that, that is a, a really good question because the, the result of the Wayfair decision, if what it has done is liberate states to be able to tax without <clears throat> rules, which, which I hope that is not how Wayfair is interpreted, but at least some states are viewing it that way, that there is no restriction on them. States can enforce tax liability through the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution, but there's no way for them to effectively enforce those requirements on companies outside of the United States. So the real effect of Wayfair is to advantage companies that are located in Canada or for that matter, located in Hong Kong or located in, in the UK, uh, because the customs, US customs will not intercept goods for the purposes of enforcing state sales and use taxes. And so it really is, is an action by the Supreme Court, probably inadvertently, to favor foreign competitors over US companies. Uh, over here. Question for George and, and possibly Mike. You know, your, your, your comments have been focused mainly on the, um, the, the sales and use tax collection obligations that small businesses are going to have to, uh, to shoulder. Do you see any implications from the elimination of the physical presence test for other types of, let's say, local business obligations that localities may try to export to, to non-resident sellers, such as business license taxes, which many times are based on gross receipts, or, or, or some other type of uh, business regulation that may be exported? So is your question, Mark, whether the Wayfair decision has implications for other kinds of taxes and regulatory obligations? I, I, I'm, I'm not thinking about like state income taxes. I'm thinking about more like local business licenses. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, it, there's, a, there's a brave new frontier here. Historically, sovereignty has governed what the scope of state regulatory authority is that states can, can tax and regulate uh, companies located within their jurisdiction, but not outside of it. What Wayfair has really introduced is the notion that as long as companies have some kind of contact with the state, they may be subject to regulatory obligations. And in fact, tax collection is a regulatory obligation, not a tax o obligation. And we don't know what the limits of that are, and I fully suspect that states are going to attempt to export that. Now, California already says, if you want to sell eggs in California, we're going to govern what size cages your hens in, uh, in Ohio uh, have to be grown in. Uh, there may be no limit to the uh, ambition that states have uh, to regulate companies outside of their borders. I'll say that I do think there is a market limit to it, right? So if you don't want to sell eggs in California, then don't sell eggs in California. Um, but it is a big market, right? So if you want to avail yourself to that market, then you'll live by their regulations. And, and that's, that's a market decision. It's a business decision. Um, if I think licensing or, or you go, kind of go down a rabbit hole like that, um, you, are, you, know, you don't do business there. I mean, and, and that's, that's, but I don't know that that's something that's even been discussed. Um, I haven't heard any discussions of that. I think that states are so excited about getting this authority, they're not contemplating any kind of expansion of it into, you know, like I said, into some, some rabbit hole. But, so but I want to remind you, Jennifer, that 
um, the purpose of the Commerce Clause was to create a free market among all the states. So when your reaction to issues of taxation and regulation are, if you don't want to sell to those states and be subject to their regulations, don't sell, the effect of that is to constrain the market, which is antithetical to what the objective of the Commerce Clause was. And let me, if I could also just add to that, I mean, I, the, we should all take a step back and think, do we want a, a functioning uh, national economy where you don't want to sell into California? I don't think there's a lot of egg sellers on eBay, but I'll, I'll check after this. <laughs> uh, but let's say you don't want to sell a specific type of, of electronic or a spe specific type because you are over-regulated. But an import from China, which is not subjected to the same thing, easily gets in. I don't think that's the type of, of, of functioning national economy that any of us uh, want to have. And I think as we go forward to your question to like the next phase of this, we should really be thinking, because our ability to get, as George pointed out, to those foreign sellers is completely different than to the domestic sellers, uh, and it can, it, can, uh, it can, you know, get into a whole lot of different, uh, very sticky issues. And I agree. I think that we have, um, speaking for ICSC, we have significant concerns about, about foreign sellers. So I think we can all join together to have that conversation um, and, you know, perhaps a more constructive uh, dynamic under the Wayfair standard. All right. Uh, looks like we're about out of time now. Uh, I want to thank you all so much, um, and thank you for coming. Uh, this has been a Congressional Internet Caucus Academy briefing, uh, and we will have another one upcoming on July 23rd. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>